Welcome, everybody, to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybel Inc. My name's Pete Wright. That there is Howard Tybel. Hello, Pete. Hello, <laughs> Howard. We did it. Oh, that was beautiful. Well done, uh, sir. Yes. Hey, uh, you know, we had this conversation, if you haven't heard it, uh, with uh, Deborah Sunea Moore last week. Have you heard this? Have I heard it? Of course I heard it. It's gone viral. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not. Sometimes I'm not sure if you've uh, if you actually listen to your own shows. So I do. I feel like I, I have to ask. I, you know, yeah. Well, I, I, sometimes I don't, mean, I, listen. I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. You, you, did you did you sense the hesitancy? Hey, yeah. it was a great conversation, and the, the whole the foundation of the conversation was all about uh, bridging tradition and innovation. It's uh, you know we say bridging, I think balancing tradition and innovation, and 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 uh, uh, celebrating both of these concepts together. And and Deborah represented uh, the Chautauqua Institution, which is this fantastic uh, uh, sort of learning and arts uh, community that uh, that offers a, a summer program. If you haven't heard that episode, uh, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it because the conversation we're having today really uh, is is built on that foundation. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you something. What I take back, thinking back to that conversation, is the difference between... Uh, and again, it's subtle language, but I think it's an important difference. This idea that we often think about either or, right? So, and I'll tell you, I was even talking. If you go, if you Google tradition versus innovation, there's a lot out there, and the concept of versus really positions tradition innovation as things that are diametrically opposed. And one of the things that Deborah said is that she sees tradition. And I think she's absolutely right as the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the legs of the table. And when I think about innovation in the context of that idea, innovation is really about how we work. You know, George Kemble, uh, who is one of the people that has inspired me, uh, talks about the need to teach people how to be innovators. It's not about the innovation. And I think how we teach people to be innovators is really about a mindset and how we approach what we're doing. And it's not about like breaking the legs of the chair. It's about evolving the conversation. So at the heart of what I think the schools that we're working with uh, are struggling with all the way from the board level all the way down to the people delivering on the services across the institution is what are those traditions uh, that are foundational and making a distinction between the foundational traditions and where we can innovate. Uh, the dilemma in a higher ed environment or an independent school environment is not only there are different constituent groups that have different points of view on that, but even within your own particular division or department, there are wildly different ideas about what it means to innovate, what we should keep doing the same and what we should change. You know, fundamentally, there are two kinds of innovations. There's innovations where the fundamental idea is you take the idea and you say, listen, here's how we do it. I want to make a blank sheet of paper. So forget about it even exists. We're creating the university from scratch. We're creating uh, a new service or product from scratch. Let's build it from the ground up. And that's, you know, exploratory at its base level. A second kind of innovation or getting people to innovate with this certain mindset is more exploding on an existing, and I say exploding not in a negative way, but in a positive way, and saying, we have this foundation in place, uh, we want to keep doing this, how do we make it better? Uh, and what's tough about those two is that there are pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, and I think where teams get stuck is trying to decide if they should step back and in a sense, create it from a blank sheet of paper to come up with a more out-of-the-box way of thinking, or should they just take their existing thing and try and tweak it? And in the absence of choosing what you're doing, I think that's part of the reason why we don't get momentum, is we don't even have agreement on the way we're approaching the innovation. You know, I, last week uh, we got into this conversation about managing expectations. I think this gets to something that you're you're alluding to here, um, and and Deborah's response 
was that we don't have to choose uh, innovation versus tradition. You know, at, at some point, um, you know, we're, we're going to present sort of a framework that is traditional, but within that framework, we're going to innovate. And then, you know, I, I think you said this, you made this comment that I've been noodling on since then. We have to create a culture that anticipates change, mm. right? And I... I really, you know, the, the part that I've been noodling over here is that I think in spite of our best intentions or our deep held beliefs that we don't have to choose between tradition and innovation, we may hold that quite personally true. But there are people in our constituent groups who truly value things not changing. Yeah. And, and there is <laughs> there is no escape from the reality of the audience when they speak up and say, you have gone too far. And yet, yeah, right. what is our responsibility in terms of innovation leadership, becoming a leader of innovation? How do you make that transition to to create that culture that anticipates innovation, that anticipates change, that is excited about the things to come and building on, uh, you know, on that legacy. Well, so I'll tell you, if you're, if you're an, an inheritor of the change versus, for example, on the task force in a particular issue, so let's say you're putting a new big system in place that's going to make things more efficient on your campus. Uh, if you're on the task force, you're learning how to balance and adjust to uh, what we're keeping and what we're not keeping. And, and what a people who are centrally part of a change forget is what it's like to be completely in the dark, which is the majority of people who are waiting for the change to happen. So I think, like your, to your point, there's no getting around the fact, and this is true for you, this is true for me, when I come into my office, I expect to see my table in a certain place. I expect to see my computer in a certain place. And when it's not there, it's disruptive. I mean, at the very basic level, we want to know what to expect when we step into something. That is human nature. I think the difference is, is people's developing the muscle. And I think so, we, have to, we have to put more people around us uh, who have this mindset where they recognize what they're, they're, when they step into a situation that what they're having is a reaction, not what just happened was bad or true or it's wrong. It's like that truly when you step into a situation and it's not what you expected, that is a reaction. And what we have to empower ourselves and be leaders around and, and, and then be role models for others is not just then to recognize it as a reaction, then to say, oh, I see. It's no longer in that place. We're doing something new. And as quickly as possible, get behind the fact that we're in this, what I'll call a confusion place, a confusion state where we don't, we cannot look back, but we cannot look forward. And I think the muscle we all have to get better at with the accelerating change happening around us with technology and also the drivers for change because of, in many cases, the business model not being able to be sustainable over the long term is we have to develop a greater capacity to recognize a reaction, move off it, and live more comfortably in the confusion, knowing that that's how we get to a better place. Oh, develop a greater capacity to recognize it and move on. And I'll tell you, that's, that is, that some of us do that naturally, and some of us, uh, I would say that there's a, major, a minority who are great at recognizing it immediately as a reaction because they love change. There's a minority who hate change and will not even recognize it as a reaction. They'll, they, they, they recognize it as a truth. What you just did was wrong. Everything should be where it was, and I need to know where it is. The majority of people need time. You know, and, and some of the story I've been telling more and more around change management is we have to give people permission to go through 
grieving something not being the way it was to being the way it's going to be, and that it's okay for people to have reactions. It's not about trying to get people to not have the reactions. We have to recognize it, allow them to go through it, show them that there'll be a better place, and then shepherd them along uh, because it's not going to be easy. Right, And your core team, I'll tell you, if, if anything that you should be aware of and to pay attention to is who you put in the, in the center of the group, you know, whatever you're calling your core team, your task force, whose job it is, is to move the needle of a, of a, of a project or initiative. The number one thing you got to pay attention to is picking the right people. And these are people who are willing to be leaders in their own way and push themselves to get outside of comfort zone. Nothing kills a project faster than having people on the team who are not willing to grow personally around the way they react to a change. Uh, you don't need experts. You don't need just experts. Sometimes you need the technology experts. You need people with the right mindset uh, that they're going to help others through the change. And if you have that, I've seen it work. We just went through a project, and it worked beautifully, and it's because the right people were picked to lead the project. You know, I I think that's great advice as we sort of wrap up. It makes me think of my kids. Now, I know you have older kids, uh, and so maybe you can. your observation may be a little bit different, but my kids are still pretty young, and one of the things I notice about that is, is their ability to recognize discomfort and move on uh, mm. long after I am still seething about something or another or still kind of bruised about something or another. My kids have moved on. Yeah. And, uh, and my son, he's eight years old. He comes home with a giant bruise down the side of his face. And he says, yeah, my best friend threw his shoe at me and hit me <laughs> in the face. I said, are you guys OK? He said, oh, yeah, we're totally fine. <laughs> the, a significant change that yeah, leaves I remember a physical when I th- mark. And I remember when I threw a shoe at you, it took you it, weeks. Yes, it to takes get over me a it. long time to get over that stuff. That's all I'm saying. Think of your kids, people. It's all about the kids. Yeah, you know, I had the same situation with with, with Max and Philip, and uh, just that experience of um, of how easy they can move on from things. And I almost feel like, how did you do that? Right. Because you we know? we subconsciously learn to not move on. Yeah. Right. We learn right. that as we get older. And I think that that's the muscle I think we need to kind of reengage is how do we embrace change personally, which will help us culturally to embrace change. This is turning into a parent's workshop. It really is. We should take this on the road. Should take this on the road. Hey, you and I, the two dads. <laughs> <laughs> That's our next chapter, Howard. I can't wait. Hey, uh, this has been a great conversation, a great two-part conversation. Again, please, folks, make sure you go back and listen to the to last week's show uh, with uh, Deborah Sunea Moore. Uh, it was a great conversation. I'm sure we will have her back. Uh, and uh, Howard, uh, thank you as usual for taking time out of your busy schedule to record uh, record get your wisdom down for the ages. Well, here's the truth. And anyone that speaks or writes for uh, not necessarily even a living, but does it on the side is I learn more from having these conversations with you from Pete. I learn about my point of view. If, if there's anything I would tell anybody that wants to grow in what they do is find opportunities to speak and find, find opportunities to write, because that's when you really learn the things that you do every day. Oh, that's a great way to wrap up. Thanks so much, Howard. Uh, You're welcome. On on behalf of the goodly, kindly Howard Teibel, I'm Pete Wright. We will catch you next week on Navigating Change, the podcast from Teibel Inc. (laughs) 